This show has been sponsored by JMG, Jobs for Maine Graduates, and BIW, Bath Ironworks. The stories you're about to hear are true. The struggles, losses, and paths to healing, all woven into Voices of Hope, The Rugged Road to Recovery. What would you like to tell us about your story? Um, from a very young age, I've always been exposed to drugs. I was starting to abuse Adderall because I would stay up late studying and then I would use opiates throughout the day to have some sort of sense of numbness because I was stuck in this pattern of feeling stupid in school. My brain just told me, you have to do this, you have to do this. Um, it didn't seem like there was an alternative. I've never been diagnosed with ADHD or anything else that I've consistently taken medication for, but I have a feeling if I had a test, I would have um, been diagnosed with that because my head just seemed to always be going in overdrive, whether it be worry or just really overexcited. And I start doing Oxycontin. I think I was about 18. And by 19, I had gone to treatment for the first time. By the age of 23, I was an IV heroin user. I took a hit. <laughs> I coughed. I didn't like it. It was really gross. And honestly, I don't even remember feeling anything initially except I had several other people in the vehicle who were pumping their fists and yelling and celebrating because they had witnessed my first use. And that was exciting to me. And here I am an hour after taking my first hit of a joint and I find myself in the car heading to go purchase my first bag of marijuana of my own. Alcoholism is like what I am and my like need for relief from the flesh prison, that I use substances to get that relief. And untreated, it leads to me drinking in a way that, that takes my brain out of my own control. And I remember sitting in school and watching the documentaries on you know heroin addicts and alcoholics and stuff like that. And I remember sitting in health class drinking alcohol out of a water bottle in high school, laughing at those people, you know. Um, fast forward, I'm now one of those people. The first time I ever tried alcohol, I knew that I wasn't supposed to be drinking it as a 12 year old. And maybe a piece of me thought that that must mean it's pretty good um, if it's restricted. But the first time I drank it, I knew I liked it. I think it was one of the first times I really felt emotionally full as a child. It was the first time I felt that warm feeling and maybe not the first time, but the first time I can remember saying, this is the stuff and this is how I want to feel. Growing up, I think that if you would have ever told someone in my family or my parents or even you know my aunts and uncles, like, Brittany's going to be a heroin addict, they wouldn't have believed you, but they would have thought that was the most outrageous thing that they'd ever heard. I was like really a vibrant, young girl, um, I went to school, you know, I loved school, I loved sports, I loved hanging out with my friends. I was sort of always in the, in the smart kid crowd. Um, I was also, I played sports, but I always felt like I was like sort of tangentially involved in a lot of different groups, cliques of people, but wasn't really, like didn't really belong in any of them. I thought I was this, you know, good girl that like got good grades, playing field hockey, you know, loved my family. I live in like a suburban neighborhood and now I'm 17 years old. It's like my last year of high school. That's supposed to be a fun year and I'm on probation um, trying to 
not drink and use drugs because I could go to a youth center. Um, it just was like crazy to me how that happened. But in the moment, it didn't feel crazy. I didn't even think anything of it. I was just like, this is everyone else's fault. You know, so by uh, senior year, um, you know, on the outside, I'm still holding it together. Uh, I'm in all AP classes, level one classes. I'm a three season captain. Uh, I have a pretty decent future ahead of me. Um, but what my family doesn't know, what most people don't know, is that as soon as I leave the soccer field, I'm getting high. Uh, right before school, I'm getting high. During school, I'm getting high. After school, I'm getting high. And I'm pretty much my existence um, is doing all those things successfully while I'm getting high. I grew up playing a lot of sports, a lot of like after school activities, um, somewhat of a social outgoing person, um, made a lot of friends and for some reason I always just felt out of place. I um, always felt like I was different, um, not worse or better than other people, just different. No matter what crew of people I hung around with, I just felt different. I felt like an outsider at all times. I remember that feeling um, from a very young age for some reason. I never knew what that was. Um, now I know that that was my addiction. My parents weren't drinkers, but one day I went to Rite Aid with my dad and he found this like five gallon bottle of wine for a disgustingly cheap amount of money. And he's like, I need to buy it because it's a deal. He never even drank, but he needed it in the house. And so I had started taking sips of that and immediately I was like, I like how I feel. This feels good. This feels like I don't have to be myself or sit still because I'm putting disgusting red wine in my orange juice when I'm 12. By the time I was 13, as I had started smoking, I had started smoking weed, and I had started stealing my dad's medication. So I had a good candy bucket of opportunity there. So by the time I was 14, I had been abusing so many opioids from my dad's medication that I got jaundice in my hands my freshman year, and I walked around with my hands being yellow. Um, and I didn't realize how scary that was until recently. At around 14, I started drinking and I kind of, I didn't know it then, but I did notice that I was a little bit more preoccupied with the alcohol than my friends were. All, meanwhile, I'm still like a straight A student, top of my class, avid soccer player, student council, all the things. Um, that would have led you to believe that I wasn't internally struggling at all. When I would drink, I would, I would black out, I would go crazy, I would have like freak outs. I remember my mom saying one time that a couple of the run-ins I had with my parents that I was literally like possessed um, under the influence of alcohol. And um, I liked to drink, but I didn't like that. My junior year of high school, um, my boyfriend at the time went to get Advil or something, you know, just like very innocently out of the cabinet. And he said to me, hey, do you know your, your dad has a bottle of like 300 Vicodin in there? We decided that day and, you know, we each took a pill. And for him, it ended that way. Um, it ended there. And for me, it was this moment of, this is how I want to feel like every moment for the rest of my life and whatever that looks like, I'm gonna do, make sure that I can do that. My drinking initially, it worked for me. Like I, this is a thing I hear a lot of other addicts talk about too. It absolutely worked for me. I loved alcohol. What it did for me in college, it helped me socialize, it, it helped me feel confident, it helped me feel funny, even though I probably wasn't any funnier that way. So it worked for quite a while. And the problem was over time, I used it more and more and it worked less and less, but I couldn't see that. I had a need to 
be a little bit less cognizant of myself and my skin. Alcohol gave that to me for a while. I probably do have that kind of sandstone brain that wears away faster, like the Grand Canyon thing with the river. And so, it, you know, it was easier for me to get trapped in a physical addiction. I would tell myself alcohol made me malleable, like workable like clay. And that if I drank, I could somewhat like control my emotions or make myself feel more more of whatever. So it's like either I could, you know, if I was feeling upset about something, I could dull it with alcohol. Or if I wanted to be able to be more like outwardly happy or joyous, I could, I could accentuate that with alcohol. Like in my head, it gave me that power. But it was not, I don't even know if it was to fit in, but it was to feel internally more a part of. Coming up. Once I experienced what it was like to be high, I got this overwhelming sense of, like, relief. Also, some of the reasons kids use has to do with their friends, you know, wanting to be accepted, experimenting, they're curious about it. Other kids are using because they want to fill some sort of a need. They might not even... New York-based clinical neuropsychologist Dr. Matt Ballas explains what even the first sips, sniffs, and pills can do to the brain and why it leads to more when Voices of Hope, the rugged road to recovery continues. JMG taught me to have better people skills, I guess. It, JMG taught me that, uh, like, how to, how to speak on the phone properly, how to have actual conversations with people. We filled out job, like, resumes and applications, and one of the big ones was for BIW because there's so many different options for so many different people in that workspace. So I mean there's a lot of things that um, just today I'm realizing came out of JMG in terms of um, good body language, firm handshakes and whatnot, just little things that a lot of people noticed that I never realized that I brought out of JMG with me. Because I feel like JMG has taught me how to be a hard worker and how to like lead people. I'd say that you could count your JMG specials for pretty much any problems you have in college really, um, or any schooling. Through our partnership with public education, JMG is providing relationship-based supports to over 11,000 students here in our state. And we're counting on JMG to help us develop the skills and the talent of our future workforce. And that is why JMG and BIW are supporting Voices of Hope. You know, asking for help is not a weakness. It is just the beginning of your journey, your story, for you to reach your fullest potential. When I was about 10 and a half, I'd say that's when my, I guess, addictive behaviors started coming out that I uh, can remember. A lot of video games. Um, always wanted to be with friends and not with my family. Um, and very shortly after, I started kind of misbehaving in school. Um, and then something drastic happened, which was my parents were getting a divorce. At the time, it flipped my world upside down. Um, it was a, something I didn't want to accept. Um, it made me feel even more different than other kids at school or at home. Um, and it started to become kind of chaotic between my parents Within the first couple months of them separating was when I really started acting out, um, stealing cigarettes from my mother, um, a lot of stealing. I, it's like I got addicted to stealing from the mall and out of my mother's purse and stuff like that. Just looking for any, um, anything that would get me out of myself. And by 12 or 13, I was stealing alcohol from my parents. Um, you know, finding marijuana from friends, older brothers, or, you know, other people, older people that were around that I knew smoked pot. And I remember the first time I drank, I got really sick. I didn't care for it. But the first time I had smoked pot, it was like a, not say, I wouldn't say an out of body experience, but I just felt like, ah, like everything's perfect. I, just remember having this feeling like, like this is it, like this is, this is like what I've been looking for. And I don't even think I realized that I was looking for anything. But once I experienced what it was like to be high, I got this overwhelming sense of like relief. 
And kind of looking back at it now, um, sure. I mean, I, I imagine that uh, early high school days, uh, you know, early teens, pretty uncomfortable in my own skin, trying to satisfy people, to uh, be part of the popular crowd, to be a successful athlete, to be good at school, just all the normal uh, things that people go through um, at that age. You know, I think once I experienced what it was like to be high, all of that fear and all of that anxiety and all of that worry just kind of faded away. And I continued to smoke weed pretty much every day after that. Um, it became priority. It became, uh, very quickly became the norm. Um, uh, I felt like I couldn't uh, get through the day without it. And I felt like uh, normal was high and being sober felt uncomfortable. Being a freshman in high school at 14, that's kind of when most of my friends started experimenting. I guess it was kind of like excitement of the unknown because there's so much don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Well, why? I want to know why not to do it. I want to try it. And I wanted to know what all of the excitement was about, the positive and the negative excitement. A lot of it was also fitting in. I wanted to feel like I fit in. I was also, I was on the field hockey team. So there was girls that I looked up to and they all went to these parties and would drink and smoke weed. And they were still doing sports and they were still getting good grades. So I thought, well, if they're doing it, then it must not be that bad. People want me to try this new thing with them where there was definitely times in my childhood before that where I didn't feel like I fit in, I felt left out. And so this felt like it was my time to like be exciting and important. And of course I had friends that weren't using drugs or drinking and I kind of just like forgot about them because I was so invested in being like, I wanted to just fit in and seem cool. That was like really what started it. And what we see over time is people who use drugs a lot, their everyday life becomes dull, gray, listless, and they start to use drugs just to feel normal. So you have a choice. You get to choose in your life how you're going to get a high. And this is the time in your life when it's so important. Dr. Yeah. Matt Bellis' expertise puts him face to face with students in classrooms all across the country. A motivational speaker, Bellis is also a clinical neuropsychologist and expert on the science of addiction and what addiction does to the brain. But when you pursue a high with a drug, okay, you're forcing your brain into a state it doesn't naturally want to be in. And your brain responds by doing various things. First of all, your brain can become damaged if you give it too much of the chemicals. But over time, let's say you use something like weed on a regular basis, your brain responds with something called homeostasis, which is it trying to maintain balance. You force your brain into a high state, the brain reacts by putting you in a low state to try to respond to it. If you look at some of the research as to the reasons why kids use it, it's really diverse, it's varied reasons. But the kids who are using often because they feel bored, and it's about 30% of teenagers who use, uh, are the ones that are more likely to go into harder drugs later on. So there's something about that reason for it, like, hey, I'm looking for stimulation, I'm bored, is predictive. And it may be the fact that the brain um, is looking for stimulation. The dopamine hypothesis of addiction basically says that you don't have enough dopamine present uh, in your brain, so you're constantly seeking out things that it's going to increase the amount of dopamine present, and, and drugs will, will force your brain into that state. And you can imagine if you have low sort of dopamine levels before you start using, use the drug, you feel good, you're more apt to use it again because of course you want to feel good. It is much more dangerous for youth to use, partly because they are more vulnerable, one, to addiction. Uh, they're, they're, uh, sensitivity to rewards and pleasure make them more apt to get addicted to a substance, but also because they have so many years of life left. And these are drugs that can alter your development. Human beings, you know, 200 years ago weren't, weren't living to 80, 90 years old. You know, now now we're, we're living long lives, but if you 
affect your brain's development at age 13, 14 years old, you know, it can have really long lasting effects. Bellis's mission is to prevent that from happening. His education module is teaching kids to literally get high on life. Okay. Here's something you should know about exercise. After 30 minutes of any exercise that gets your heart rate up, could be cycling, could be swimming, could be running, your brain releases chemicals. Do you know what they're called? Endorphins, nice. One of those endorphins is a funny name though. Anandamide. Anandamide gets released when you exercise for about 30 minutes or more. It improves your mood and improves your memory. Smoking weed, which by the way, THC, the active ingredient in marijuana, looks so much like anandamide. I'll show you a picture later how similar they are. Smoking weed has the opposite effect. Do that three, four times a week as a teenager, your mood gets worse, your memory gets worse. When you do it naturally through sports, through laughter, through meditation, what happens is your brain releases these chemicals and you feel good, but it balances the chemicals. It never releases so much of the chemicals that it damages your brain tissue. Up next, when drugs and alcohol take over, First time that I used Oxycontin, for sure, it was like my true love. And the desperation to keep that glow going. Next, on Voices of Hope, the rugged road to recovery. My JMG specialist works really well with everybody, figuring out what they like best and what suits them. When BIW started their hiring spree, I finally decided to put my application in and see where it went. And actually yesterday marked two years since my hiring date. Thank you to JMG and to Bath Ironworks for giving me the chance that I have at 21 years old to be able to actually have my own house at this point and be able to buy new cars and be, be able to support my own hobbies and dreams and stuff like that. So. And we're counting on JMG to help us develop the skills and the talent of our future workforce. And that is why JMG and BIW are supporting Voices of Hope. You know, asking for help is not a weakness. It is just the beginning of your journey, your story, for you to reach your fullest potential. Drugs can hijack the brain. It can replace a drive state like eating or drinking with craving the substance. And so the first time you use, it can get this euphoric effect and it felt so great, this real positive experience. But eventually, at some point, it becomes a chemical dependence. You cross over from, oh, I'm experimenting, this was fun, I was with my friends, to now you are physically dependent on the chemical and your brain has figured out a way to hijack your thoughts and make you want to pursue that drug at all costs. And it really wasn't until I, I graduated high school, and it was really the summer uh, beyond high school when I really started to um, get into Oxycontin and get into the opiates, which again was um, an experience like no other. The first time I did it, it, it and it kind of seems like this with every drug that I use, but first time that I used Oxycontin for sure, it was like my true love, <laughs> right? It was like, this is it. And, uh, and I ran with it. And by the time I was 16, I was stealing alcohol, selling it to my friends, using very hard substances, skipping school. And my decisions and my identity had become unrecognizable in the midst of what I was sacrificing to be high. Earlier on in my drinking, it felt, it, it didn't necessarily feel like a crutch to me, but it felt like an enhancer. And over time, it definitely turned into that. And it was probably more than a crutch. It was like a wheelchair and a dialysis machine. And it was everything. Like, I felt as if I couldn't function without it. It's like if I had to go to the grocery store, it's like better have a drink first so we can go handle the grocery store. And shortly after that, it was, I started trying Suboxone. Um, and I had no idea what it was. Um, it made me really sick but I felt really good at the same time. And a few days after I had tried the Suboxone, I um, figured out through a couple other friends that I was using with that it was an opiate. So I started chasing the opiates, whatever it was, Vicodin, Oxycontin, Codeine, um, whatever I could steal out of a medicine cabinet at 15. That's what I wanted to do um, over anything. Addiction is everywhere. Addiction touches every one of us. And that's the reason for the Voices of Hope series. 
In partnership with this station, we have an interactive multimedia information portal where you can access critical information, phone numbers, and services. Through the courage of real people sharing their own stories, their struggles, darkest hours, tragic losses, and for the fortunate, their victories, our hope is that there can be better understanding, support, compassion, and help for the millions who are right now struggling with their own substance use disorder. We'll be back next time with another episode of Voices of Hope, The Rugged Road to Recovery. Recognize myself for the first time in the mirror today. Spent so long in the dark Now I'm stepping out I'm finally feeling brave When you're lost inside a maze That you created for yourself in your own brain You'll start to lose sight of the light I've been there before Today, for the first time, I was able to forgive myself. Today, for a new life, I could stop being somebody else. I never could see the sun, but now. I finally won today for the first time I forgave myself back on my feet for the first time since they made me think less of me It's been too long years Never thought I'd be here I'm who they made me scared to be I never could see the sun But now that I'm here I finally If you or someone you know has an addiction or recovery story to share, you can reach us through our website, voicesofhopeandrecovery.org. Special thanks to our sponsors, JMG, Jobs for Maine Graduates, and BIW, Bath Ironworks.